Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the seminar today. I really appreciate it. Um, before I get started, I want to just talk about who Accurate Controls is and, and what we do and what we've done, just to give you a flavor for our experience in the industry. So Accurate Controls is considered a, an original equipment manufacturer for the corrections industry. Okay, so what does that mean? We're an integrator. Well, what does that mean? We're a lot of, we're about four different things rolled into one company. So we're part custom engineering, part custom software development, part manufacturing of pre-assembled or pre-manufactured equipment, so we are our assembly group, and then we're an implementation group as well. So that's what an OEM really means. So, um, like was said, we were established in 1982, and we've developed well over 500 projects over the last 20 years. And um, we typically keep about 60 projects in our production facility at any given time. Um, so as he indicated, our, what we're best known for is providing non-proprietary equipment and software for our facilities that we work with. Okay, so market area, that, that's the area that we work in. And um, we don't really work in the Upper East Coast, and I don't like to go to Alaska because it's cold there, but I'm from Wisconsin. Um, so, again, the market. Accurate Controls was, has been recognized by Correctional News for the last 17 years, and we're one of the leading system integrators um, in the market. And, um, again, that's 2017 below it and um, last year's. So... As Joe indicated in his presentation, this is basically the entire list of everybody who does security electronics for the corrections market that says, this is our market, this is what we do. So it's, there isn't a lot of folks that really do what we do. So, and that's one of the issues that we're going to talk about. So what's a security integration system? What is it comprised of? You have integration software, network equipment, and servers. Um, the thing that everybody talks about is the SCADA package or the software that makes a security automation system, the front end. What it looks like, that is called, um, that's typically used in our market is Wonderware or Indusoft, okay? And everybody talks about that. Well, simply that is a building tool that we use and that's what we create the logic and the graphics for you to control your facility, okay? That's probably one of the biggest um, parts of our system, and it's, it's the thing that is probably the least understood by people that don't develop systems, okay? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So your integration software, your computers, your networks. Next, your PLC. What a PLC stands for is Programmable Logic Controllers, and that's basically the backbone of the security automation system that controls your lights, controls your doors, monitors your doors, and your miscellaneous devices. Then you have an audio system. There's a lot of different manufacturers. The one that's probably used the most would be Harding Instruments. Um, so there's, there's, um, but there's other manufacturers that serve the market as well. Um, closed circuit television, that's how everybody phrases it. That's changed, now it's called video management systems. Those are a lot of the manufacturers that you'll see utilized in all kinds of video management system applications. So there's a lot of different manufacturers to choose from. Some work better in a corrections environment than others. Um, and there's um, another thing as a county, you may already have a standard. And uh, so you may be already working with one of these manufacturers. Um, and the next question is, how does that apply to our new project or an existing project? So that's probably one of the biggest questions you're going to want to ask yourself. And your IT manager, the people that manage the, the video aspect of your county, or in some cases, state. So access control, same thing. There's a lot of different manufacturers. Um, but let's get right down to the brass tacks of it. For 30 years, Accurate Controls has been developing non-proprietary systems, and we've talked a lot about that. And you've probably heard a lot of my presentations in the past that talk about what makes a system proprietary, what makes a system non-proprietary in nature. 
Well, so what does it really mean? There's two aspects to consider. Hardware aspect and then the software aspect. Now, pretty much everybody in the industry provides a non-proprietary hardware aspect. Pretty much everybody, but not all. Okay, so you, as an owner, as a specifier, you want to be really careful on who you're pre-qualifying and what products they provide and whether or not their hardware is proprietary in nature. Keep in mind, if you get proprietary hardware, well, you're only going to get one source to buy that from, from the, for the life of that system. Now let's talk about software. Now software is something that could be non-proprietary or it could be proprietarized, even though it may be Wonderwear or maybe Indusoft. Okay, does that make sense? And, you know, I've talked about this a lot in the past. So, um, you know, you have to be really careful when you're specifying and buying software and how people create their integrated system. So, let's talk about this. Um, this is an advertisement, and I'm going to do a case study about this company. So, this company, this is an advertisement from their website, and it's an advertisement um, that... You'll see. So, as it says, non proprietary industry standard wonderwear. So, you think, okay, no problem. It's non proprietary in nature. Well, we got one of their projects way back in 2009, and um, we tried to retrieve the software. The owners thought, yep, it's non proprietary. We can get anybody to work on this thing. So, they call us in, we pull the software out, we can't open it up. So, we can't open it up. <clears throat> So we send it to Wonderware because it's a Wonderware file, right? Well, Wonderware can't open it up either. And they write this letter that says, um, basically, the application wasn't provided by Wonderware. So whose was it? All right. Now, this is a company called Metroplex. Their advertisement was Metroplex. Okay. Well, that company was owned by Argyle, and I'm going to do a case study here in a minute. But kind of the biggest thing, and I like to show this one, was an ad they ran in Correctional News a couple years ago. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, it said this, advanced integration is proprietary, deal with it. So I, I like to use this because it's a good representation of really how our industry views um, proprietary nature of software and how they really view you as a customer. Deal with it, that's what we do, okay? So you as an owner, I don't know if it's up to me, I don't like to deal with stuff that I don't like to deal with. So why we, why we want to make this point is, as a specifier or as a buyer of this, you may not want to put yourself in that position because that system's life expectancy is 15 years, 15 years, and if you're locked in, you're locked in. You're not going anyplace else. So here's a case study. Again, I've been talking about this forever. So uh, this is Riverside, California. Um, Back in 2016, from Correctional News Report, Argyle was the largest DEC and the largest security integrator in the market. So there's um, a job comes out, and the bridging documents, the consultant who developed the bridging documents did a great job. They required a non-proprietary approach, and um, they did everything they could, and they produced a bridging document, and a design-build contractor was um, selected. But that design build contractor didn't identify their DEC or their SEC. As a result, the design build contractor was, cap was able to select their integrator, and they selected that integrator and that detention equipment contractor based around low price. And the numbers, and I can, I can tell you that we were involved in the process of selection. We weren't selected, we elected not to do the price shopping exercise. But basically, the numbers were shopped, as Joe mentioned in his presentation. The numbers were shopped. It went from up here to down here, and that was the, that was the selection. It wasn't based on qualification or anything like that. So here's a summary. Yes, sir, Joe.
Joe's exactly right. So if anybody, if, if the pre-qualifications had been done, the, the result would have revealed that they were having significant financial issues. Um, and they were accessible, it's a publicly traded company, so you could get it off their website. And we did the research, it, they had significant losses, and it was just a matter of time. So they end up getting this job, and currently that project's not done, but it's 500 days past due. Um, in May of 2018, our gal who we're talking about enters receivership. And um, kind of fast forward from May, um, they have other companies finishing that work, and uh, the bonding company, as I understand it. Um, so in January, the owners seek out sources to review the Metroplex software. And they actually reach out to us and say, can you help us um, determine whether or not anybody else can modify the software and if anybody else can work on it? So we said, sure. So in February, um, they reach out to us. In March, we get their initial software. And we figure out that we can't open up some of the files. Pretty much all the files that mean anything, we can't open up or modify or look at or do anything. Even though it's Wonderware. It's not proprietary, it's not. So we asked, well, we're missing some of these files. So we asked, could we, we're missing these files. Can you give us these files? Can you give us the source code? And um, that was in March, and we still don't have um, any of that information. And I'm not sure we will get it. So that was as of June, we, we reported, we're still waiting, and we're still working with that county. So, anticipated completion is August 2019 now. It's a brand new $340 million project. And the question is, who will warranty and maintain that system over the course of time? And that's ultimately the question. So, um, you know, this is an example of, of how important um, the pre-qualification and, and getting um, the right system and the, the specified system. So our definition of what non-proprietary is, is that the specified system should allow anybody with a development license the ability to modify that software, okay? So if this is something you want to do, you um, first of all should, as part of your prequal, uh, you should ask, you know, indicate where you put your logic and how you develop it. And if you see that it's developed in a, what is called a compiled file, and I won't get into all the boring software stuff because, again, I'm not sure how many software developers are here, but it's, it's what's called a compiled file, okay? So a .dll, a .exe, a .net extension is typically synonymous with a compiled file. And, like, if you go into Microsoft in your computer and you try to open up one of their .exe extensions or .net extensions or .dll, you can't open it, you can't modify it, right? Because they own that. So that's one thing. Another thing is, um, should require that all the control and monitoring logic be developed within the SCADA package or Wonderware or Indusoft program. It should be their IODA server. That's number two. Number three, require that the integrator turn over the source codes and most importantly, um, have somebody that the owner trusts to authenticate that their software is actually developed in that Wonderware package. We actually authenticate other integrators' software all the time. Um, we're uh, recently, um, CML for example, they have two projects in California that had this requirement and they sent us the entire source code for a large project in California. We were able to o open it up, we were able to look at all their logic and we were able to modify it if we wanted to. And we wrote a letter that said, this is absolutely non-proprietary in nature, um, and we're good to go. So that, that is an, uh, an example of how the owners can protect themselves. And then one of the other things we recommend is that you purchase a development license with your project. So we would buy a development license and issue it to you as the owner. And then we can go through that same practice and say, okay, Mr. Owner, bring your folks that you want to maintain the system Let's show you where and how we develop the software and where it exists. And, and that way, you may not be a software developer, but at least you can see how things were developed. And then you can be protected from a situation like Riverside. And, um, and so that's why we recommend it. Um, 
So again, qualification-based uh, selection, um, years in the industry, financial stability, um, history of providing a non-proprietary approach, or on the other side of that coin, history of providing a proprietary approach. Oh, do you typically provide non-proprietary or, or is it proprietarized? Um, so that's something that you probably may or may want to consider as you go through the pre-qualification process. Um, all right. Joe talked about the downturn of the industry. Um, people are, le or not downturn of the industry, downturn of the people supporting the industry, I should say. Um, so since that's happened, we have a couple of companies that are brand new to the industry that say, we're gonna enter the corrections market. And so I wanna provide another case study, and this is the Department of Juvenile Justice down in Georgia. It was a small project, 52 cameras, 11 doors, pretty simple. Um, and there was a company called Convergent Technologies, large national security installer. Um, they, I wouldn't classify them as an OEM or an integrator, as I previously you know, explained what that was. So they didn't really develop custom systems. They didn't, they didn't do a lot of research in how these systems are developed. So what happens, they're having problems on developing the project. Um, Part of the issue um, was limited coordination with the owners. What do the owners really want is part, part of their system. Sub substituting products uh, without the owner approval, and then you know there wasn't any factory witness test, so the owners didn't get a chance to kick the tires. Well, the end result was the contractor didn't get the system running. There's all kinds of problems with the, the actual installation, and they just walked away from the project. And, um, and the facility didn't open on time, and there's an additional cost for another contractor to finish the installation. And how do I know this? How do I know this is because we were asked to help finish that job. So that's how I know about this project and the situation that was caused. Now, again, this goes back to how to avoid the situation. Qualification-based selection. You as a person who's gonna buy a brand new system or, or brand new facility, you may wanna look at them at the integrator and say, do they have really the experience to do this? Or, you know, um, they may be a really small company, but they may be a really big company that doesn't necessarily have the expertise built into their company to do system integration. It's way more complicated than people give it credit for. It's, it's taken 30 years to develop it for us, and, um, and we're developing every day. So, Again, if, you know, these are two case studies, two examples of maybe situations to try to avoid. Um, and you know, we see it as kind of, a, as, as a, not a kind of a problem, it's a really big problem in the industry. And so it may be something you wanna try to consider avoiding. So any questions so far? Based on your experience, DJ, um what would you say the premium is when you have to go in and redo a system? Where a person's locked out, they don't have a source code, doesn't work anymore, and now you gotta go in and try to pick up the pieces. What is your experience both in dollars and time it's gonna take to get that system back online? Or get it finished? So we, we have a dedicated service department for our customers and we'll oftentimes get facilities that will call us and they'll say well we've had this you know system installed for two week, two or three years or a year or, you know maybe longer and they'll say you know what we're frustrated with the cost because I'm required to sign a maintenance contract for a person to even I can call them and, and then they don't even respond and so depending on whether or not it was proprietary hardware or just proprietary software um, we'll research it and, you know, and if it's just proprietary software, we have to go in and redevelop the whole application and it can be sometimes pretty easy depending on who initially developed it. Or it can be really complicated because the documentation is not, they don't have any supporting documentation. So then you have to reverse engineer everything they did to develop the software as it relates to the hardware. Um, and in some cases, um, there's, we have another um, customer that we worked with down in Georgia that has a very proprietarized system that's hardware and software. 
and it's not that old, and it's, they're going to spend somewhere around $2.4 million to replace it. So, you know, and think about this, again, the Riverside project, that, that case study that I just had, I mean, that's a $36 million detention equipment package and security electronics package. So the security electronics package is expensive, you know, $10 million. So this is not like a minor deal. It's, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Yes, sir. My question is, and you just basically touched on it, but I don't think some of the uh, sheriff's departments and IT departments and maybe even the county commissioners realize what a proprietary door control system can actually cost you. So let's say you set up a county jail. Uh, I'll use Douglas County, Georgia as a prime example of mine. All right, the $108 million county jail that we built Oh, eight or nine years ago. And they wrote in a proprietary door control company and what they didn't realize and what the sheriff's department never knew was gonna hit them was once the warranty period was up for 365 days, this software controls company came back with their maintenance contract that you had to sign in order for your system to operate. Would anybody here like to take a guess what they think the service contract cost per year? Anybody want to take a shot? Bob Scotty, you want to take a shot at it? You don't want to take a shot at it? It was $640,000 per year. And you had to put two of their own people on your staff to actually run the, run the equipment, correct? That's right. Now, yeah. that is probably an extreme example of what a proprietary system can cost, but it doesn't change the fact that every proprietary system comes with a cost, comes with a price tag. So Wayne County is getting ready to do a large complex, so is Marion County here. If you're talking about a non-proprietary system, you're talking about an owner just bought the facility, owned his own equipment. If you're not gonna own your own equipment, you're gonna pay a service contract in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, like I said, and that's every year. That doesn't get you any new equipment, that just gets you the opportunity to maybe get some service, correct? You're exactly right, Joe. And so what we what we find out when we, we get calls from, from a county, XYZ County, um, what we find out is, okay, we, you don't have any other options but to maybe replace your equipment. Well, how much is that going to be? And it's going to be, say, $500,000, small county jail, small and medium county jail. It's five hundred grand to, to replace and upgrade it all. Well, the problem is, is there is not the ability to finance $500,000 unexpectedly to that county. So they're almost better off paying the service contract in a, a small county jail. You might be talking eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, granted, over the course of that lifetime of that system, they're going to pay a lot more than that. Um, you know, over ten years or fifteen years. Um, but it's easier to do that than than to have the additional expense one time to do it. So it becomes kind of this catch twenty two that counties get into that they can't get out of. So. So to be able to avoid it right from the beginning, like I said, I've been talking about it for 30 years, um, and you know it's something that we still see happening, and it's unfortunate. That's not our philosophy; it's never been. And um, you know, if you'd like to learn more about it, we're happy to talk about it and explain how things are done um, within software. And then I can get into the, the geek part of what's fun about being an integrator. So, um, so anyway. So that's uh, proprietary, non-proprietary. Um, thanks for the great questions. So modular approach. Um, this is something you've heard about a couple times today. I've talked about it. Mike's talked about it. Joe's talked about it. Um, so what it is is um, a method to avoid installing a bunch of stuff on site. And so um, the traditional approach to building a building, uh, utilizing, say, a steel cell or another type of modular um, cell product is you, you set the steel cell, okay? And then you build an entire building around the steel cell or other cell. And then once the entire building's done, you get an equipment room, okay? And as they're building the building and whatnot, you install conduit. So you go through and install a conduit, each conduit for the door, each conduit for the intercom. And then once all the conduit's done, the equipment room's done, then we can finally install the cable and another con contractor comes in and installs all the cable, and that kind of takes a long time, and there's a whole bunch of coordination. And then that's finally done, and then you install the field devices, you install the locks, you install the intercoms, and again, that takes a ton of time. 
And then once the equipment room is finally done, condition, you can set your equipment racks, and then you can terminate every one of those wires, train them, and terminate all those wires in that head-end equipment. And if anybody's done one of those projects, um, it's kind of a mess um, to coordinate all that. So that's traditional approach to construction of a jail as it relates to secure electronics. So, um, oh yeah, once the equipment room, the control room is done, then you can finally set and you can finally start the system. By the way, we're the last people out of your facility, typically, and you know, time at the end is sometimes consolidated or crunched down a little bit, so that time to start all that stuff, test it all, get all that done, can be overwhelming for everybody. So, um, several years ago, um, actually Karen Sickner is one of your jobs, um, we were asked, we were trying to get, a, it was a design build job and the electrical contractor said, boy, if I didn't have to run all the conduit, install the cable, do all the installation, I could probably get this thing into budget. So we kind of looked at each other, Mike was there, Bob was there, and we kind of looked at each other and, and Karen asked, well, is that possible to factory install it? And we said, I think so, yeah, we could probably figure that out. So that's what we came up with. So steel cell, we decided that we'd pre-manufacture all of the electronics conduit wire cable in their cell and use a pre-connectorized cell. So the steel cell is manufactured and then at the plant Mike installs an electrical box on the back of a cell and then at the plant he installs the cable in the conduit, all the devices, the intercom and it goes back to a cabinet. Okay so it's all done, it's all locked. So a truck comes by, picks it up, takes it to the job site. Okay and the cells are delivered, completed, and now, once the equipment room's done, we install one conduit and one set of cables to the first cell, and that's it. So we've re dramatically reduced the amount of conduit and the amount of cabling. Um, one of the things we're developing right now is a method, now that LED lights are kind of standard, the ability to also do lighting control as part of this. So we're further reducing the amount of conduit and wire cable that's necessary to, to, to get a system running. So again, the equipment, the control room set, and now we can test the system. So that's what a steel cell looks like. That's what it looks like when it's being delivered. You saw that in Mike's presentation. That's what the back of the cell looks like. Um, that's something else that uh, you saw in Mike's presentation. Basically, that's all Mike's equipment, okay? Now, um, typically we use a rear chase, but we can use a side chase, other um, configurations. Two doors, two intercoms are controlled by one cabinet. Here's some of the projects that we've done. And as you can see, it's um, picking up some momentum. And um, we're doing a lot of those projects here in Indiana. Uh, one of the things we're also doing is it doesn't relegate you to utilizing us exclusively. Okay, so we're working with uh, the folks at SAS. Um, they use Omron PLCs. We're gonna use you know, Omron PLCs in this configuration and that's something we're working together with. So other integrators can use it. We have other projects that other integrators are using. So it's not exclusive to accurate controls. Okay, all right, so, whoop, Saginaw. <laughs> all right, so when we first started talking about this, we were hoping to achieve $1,500 to $2,500 per cell in savings. Well, obviously we've done a lot of projects now. And what we're seeing is that cert, because of how the economy's increased, there's more projects, there's been a downturn in the number of electrical contractors and laborers that are available to do the work. So what we found is that there's, a significant, there's significantly more savings because of the labor market. So in Clinton County, Iowa, we had about $4,500 worth of savings. McLean, Illinois, we had about $3,800 worth of savings. And Paulding County was about $3,200. And Wayne County was about $5,500 in savings per cell, okay? So when you're talking 600 cells, it's a lot of money. Or 200 cells, or even 50 cells, it's a lot of money. Now, there are some other things that we found that we didn't realize when we were first doing this. So we can further reduce scheduling in logistics on the project site. Um, 
the intercoms, the doors, the, the, the DPS that are factory installed, again, saving a lot of time. Um, the security equipment rooms are smaller. So you have smaller footprint, less HVAC. Anybody that's designed a jail from an architectural perspective, nobody wants to put in a security equipment room. It's like wasted space because you don't, out of sight, out of mind, right? So we can now make those rooms a lot smaller. A um, lot less termination in the head end because it's a pre-connectorized. We can do it in the field. Um, we have increase in uh, maintenance efficiencies. But the biggest thing that we found is that the contraband in the construction, that cell stays closed, locked, and secured. So you're not gonna have a whole bunch of trades going in there, maybe using the combi unit before the plumbing's fully installed, kind of a problem. Um, using that cell as a construction storage place, so there's um, maybe some damage that might be caused. Um, so uh, the other thing from an operator perspective, you're not gonna have any contraband in that cell, or, there, or it's significantly reduced. So um, there's a lot of other benefits just besides cost that this system has really proven itself in. So that's the modular approach. Um, it's really a steel cell, poly jail, accurate, um, and it saves time and money, which to get these things in a budget, that's, that's what we have to do. So um, anybody have any questions with regard to that? Uh, that yes, sir. Group of cells uh, also go out. So if you have 15 cells attached to one of those modules, if you have one of those cells go out that's the lead, does they, do they all go out? No, that's, that's a great question, so thank you. Does, uh, hopefully everybody heard the question. Um, so great question, absolutely a concern when we initially developed this. So what we're using is a pass-through pass network switch. So if that one panel goes offline, the network connection will pass through to the, to the rest of the panels down the line. In addition to that, the system monitors those panels. So if it does go offline, it enunciates for the, to the officer. Okay, so they know that that system's offline. Okay, so the officer will be notified immediately as well. So, um, but no, if they were to just lose that one panel, it's gonna pass it through to the rest of the panels. Does that make sense? It would affect one lower cell and then typically one upper cell. So two individual cells. Um, the linking of them, um, given the lock and the current draw, we're linking eight panels together or 16 cells. Okay, so you have one home run per 16 cells, typically. So. Um, takes about, Five minutes, again, you're just, and I have, a, I have a video, if you'd like to see it, I can show you it. Um, you basically, it's a Molex connector, it's a pre-connectorized pre cable, so you just pull the cables apart, you put a new backplane in, and you reconnect the cables, that's it. And they're situated so you cannot plug them in wrong, so they're, they're, they only go together one way. Yes, sir? projects that were up here, two of them, McLean County, Illinois, and Clinton County, Iowa. What I think sometimes what we fail to mention, I know the people from River City Construction are here. Um, on McLean County, Illinois, the cost savings from using that modular control was actually the money that helped the county go ahead with the project. Without that cost savings, it still might not have been a project. Is that correct, Mark Ward? Yes, sir. All right. And so I think sometimes we forget about how crucial that is to projects, especially in this day and age when the money's so tight on construction, um, man hours are, are way up, the labor rates are up, electrical, mechanical, plumbing numbers are way up, so the numbers are getting tighter and tighter. So if we could put together a number like, I just did the math on that Wayne County, that's a $4 million delta cost savings, give or take. Right, Rick, right? Yeah, and that helps us too. Okay, great, thank yeah. you, TJ. Thanks, Rick. Um, and Mark, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's a great question and comment. So that's the modular control system. Works really well. We've had a lot of success with it. Um, if you have any questions, um, by all means, 
I can show you the video how you install it, how you deinstall it. It's uh, pretty simple. Um, so um, next, one of the questions we keep getting is, what's new in the industry? Again, what are the, what are the things that are changing quickly in your industry? Well, I would say the biggest change in our, in the security electronics industry and the most cost that we have a single system in the integrated system is video management systems, okay? That's the single most expensive part of a security automation system. And quite honestly, that industry and video management systems have changed really quickly over the last eight years since they've been introduced. Mike uh, from Bosch is here. And um, we really started implementing video management systems about eight years or so. And now they have a lot of features, tons of features. And how do you manage that? And here's what I want to talk about is some of the new things that, that we're seeing as far as video analytics. And I'll get into what is a video, what is video analytics. Um, but you know, be, beyond the recording requirements, um, what's new with that? So video analytics, what is it? What's well, called metadata? Well, well, what is that? So it's data derived from the video. Okay, so like every one of us, we can think about what's happening in 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 our situation. So what we want to do is build in intelligence into video, if that makes sense. Um, so data derived from from video is metadata, or also video analytics. So um, another way to think about it is. Um, is a description of what's going on inside your video. All right, now these cameras, and this is, the, this is the hard part about it, is they do a lot of things. So one of the things we did, we did Cook County RDU, is they came to us and said, hey look, can you tell us if somebody or something is moving too fast in, um, in, the, in the scene, right, or in the day room? So a couple years ago we came up with a situation where if objects are moving too fast in your video, it's indicative of three things. Number one, a fight. Either somebody's running to a fight or running away from a fight. When that happens, even if your officer isn't monitoring the system, they should be notified, right? So if objects are moving too fast, well. Another thing we've done is we've now, that was like the first generation of video analytics. The next one is, now we can determine if a person in, say, an orange jumpsuit or a red jumpsuit or a green jumpsuit is moving too fast in video. So, um, so that's our engineering department, and this is what happens when you give engineers, I need some video of what's going on, so this is what they come up with. So anyway, so um, that's our engineering department, and uh, when I said, hey, I need a sample video for a presentation, that's what they came up with, which I thought was hilarious. But, so another thing we can do is we can base it around color. We can base it around time, okay? Um, another thing, and I talked about this earlier, is now we can teach a camera how to read. So when a vehicle pulls up and it has certain writing, now we can tell it to alarm. We can have it enunciate in the control room to, hey, you got a car there, let's unlock the door or let's do something with it. But the, the thing, that we're trying to figure out, because this is really new, is what can, what can the video detect for you, okay? So what do you want it to do and where do you want it to do it? Um, so we can detect a person, a vehicle in an area. Uh, we can differentiate between an inmate and an officer. For example, again, going back to the color thing, after hours in the day room, um, no person's supposed to be walking around the day room. So if there's motion, for example, if there's motion after nine o'clock at night when the day room's locked down, um, you should sound an alarm. However, you have an officer wearing a brown uniform, for example, and they're doing their watch tours. Well, it won't alarm if a person with a brown uniform walks into a day room, it won't go into alarm, okay? But anything else, orange jumpsuit, red jumpsuit, green jumpsuit, or just a person running around without a jumpsuit, goes into alarm. So those are some of the things we're trying to navigate and figure out with you as you build these new facilities. Okay, direction of motion. Why is that important? Okay, maybe important for walking down a corridor. You have people, when you're walking this way, you're on, you know, you always have to be on the right versus taking up the whole 
corridor or direction of motion for a vehicle. Maybe you want to sound alarm. Deviation from traffic patterns. Um, and then, like we just talked about, we call it camera training. I call it teaching it how to read. Okay? So, what we're trying to do is figure out how to understand your needs. Tim Redden from Meet and Hunt, you and I were just talking about this. Um, from a consulting perspective, this is a really difficult thing to try to specify and try to delineate up front in your project. And why it's important is because a lot of these video analytics, Mr. IT manager says, I want video analytics on all, all the cameras. Okay, well, what do you want to do and where? You got 100 cameras, and it takes us, typically somebody, like the, the, the day room cameras, we can copy that analytic across all of those cameras. However, a lot of that stuff is developed on site. Okay, so we have to develop that. We can't test it at our factory. We have to create it on site, and that takes time. And that, depending if it's not delineated well, it's, it could take a lot of time. Okay, so if we have 500 cameras and it takes four hours of our time on site or longer, um, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money for something that you may or may not want. So, right, Tim, that's, that's an issue, right? Absolutely. So how are you managing it? We specify, when we specify analytic, we specify that you have to be, that the contractor has to be on site with the owner to go through the analytics and to set the analytics in place. And we get that, that time period, whether it be two days, three days, or whatever, depending on the size of the system. And then we also provide a time, whether three months or four months down the road, because there's a learning period for each one of the owners to figure out exactly how they can utilize the analytics that are available to them. So that's, uh, that's the way that we're doing that. Um, a lot of the analytics, some of the analytics we will put in the specification in certain areas. Obviously there, there's no reason to pay for something that you're not going to use. So uh, we uh, dictate that according to the area that's necessary. Yeah. So thank you, Tim, and, and, and the reason we want to talk about this is there's a lot of folks that don't really understand what they're asking for when they require it as part of a project, and it can be something that can cost you a lot of money. So it goes back to how do we manage budgets? Well, this is one of these things that, you know, that we want to talk about because it's the most expensive part of your security automation system. So that's why it's important to talk about. It's really cool technology. Obviously, we like doing really fun stuff. Obviously, my engineers love doing that too. So it's something that we have to understand moving forward in a project. So thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. So um, what we're trying to figure out is um, where it's at. Um, one camera, multiple cameras. Um, we need direction so we can manage the budget and maintain that. So um, we don't want to have more additional cost to your project than you really need. And then the last thing we want to talk about is partnering with a video management provider. Um, we work with Bosch. Um, they are great. One of the things that they do, and one of the reasons why we like to work with them, is they do a great job of managing the software maintenance cost of your video management system. They're really good about training you as the owner so that you can maintain and monitor and manage the system yourself. Um, and the thing that we like working with them a lot with is they actually listen to us about creating analytics and, and things that serve your application really well. So those are some of the things we do with Bosch, um, but we also work with other VMS providers, whether that be Genetech or ExactVision, and they're all really good as well. So um, some things to take in consideration. Um, so that's all I have. Hopefully I kept it within the time. Does anybody have any last questions that they'd like answered? If not, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Alderson, and, um, and here he comes to talk about water management systems, and um, thank you.